Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice break. My name is Dave Nicolation, and I have the honor of uh, moderating the next two panels, uh, both of which will be focused on new energy systems. Uh, we're going to start the day with Robert Johnson, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm a longtime uh, BC public servant, most recently retired, uh, was Deputy Minister of Energy, Mines and Petroleum Resources. I retired about two years ago and I'm now a strategic advisor with McCarthy Tetro. Uh, I have the honor of moderating this panel the way it's going to work. I will introduce each of the speakers uh, with a short uh, introduction as they do their presentations. Uh, then we will gather at the end for some Q&A. So again, I would encourage everyone to please submit your questions uh, in the app. So we're going to start off with uh, Robert Johnson, uh, RJ, some of you may know him by, is a special advisor on energy and climate to Eurasia Group. RJ founded the firm's energy, climate and resource practice in 2006, served as the firm's CEO from 2013 to 2018, uh, which experienced a period of rapid growth and inter international expansion. RJ has 25 years experience working closely with corporate and institutional investor clients in the oil and gas, mining, electric power, and clean tech sectors on strategy, risk assessment, government relations, and communications around policy, markets, and geopolitics. And uh, RJ, with that intro, I will turn it over to you to do your keynote address. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. I appreciate the kind introduction, and it's nice to be with everybody here uh, virtually this afternoon and look forward to the uh, discussion on the panel here uh, today. So as Dave mentioned, a lot of the work in my career has been focused on Canada's place in the global energy geopolitical landscape and within the global energy transition. And certainly, um, that question about Canada's role in global energy uh, is taking on even more relevance in the context of everything that we're seeing around the Russia-Ukraine war and around the climate emergency that we're facing globally and is the focus of discussion here today. So I'll, I'll spend some time going through these slides, then look forward to uh, interacting with the other panelists. Next slide, please. You can go to the next one. <clears throat> So I just want to talk a little bit about Russia to start with, um, you know, Russia's disproportionate uh, large role in the global oil market, you know, producing almost 12 million barrels a day before the war started, you know, and the black arrows basically show where their crude oil is going and the red arrows show where their gasoline and diesel and fuel oil is going. And as you can see, um, you know, this is a very important source of global supply that's being disrupted. But really, it's the case of a lot of uh, that Russian oil that was going to Europe is now going to places like Japan and uh, pardon me, like China and India, in large part because once it's on a tanker, it's fairly easy to move it. So I think a big part of the discussion here today is as the world adjusts to probably lower volumes of Russian crude oil and natural gas, or at a minimum, different trade patterns around Russian crude oil and natural gas, what are the opportunities for Canada? to provide both traditional sources of energy as well as new uh, low and zero carbon energy solutions to help maintain global energy security, particularly with our key allies like the United States, Europe, Japan, et cetera. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about oil because that's not the most relevant topic here today, I know, but what I, what I will say is that um, there's a lot of discussion right now about we know the Europeans are gonna need more oil, they're gonna get less oil from Russia, but you know, where will the Canadian barrels fit into that? And I, and I think the answer is that we're moving from a calculation where it's all about cost and trying to find the lowest cost barrels to uh, increasingly, especially in Europe, <coughs> a focus on just transition considerations and on greenhouse gas intensity. So ultimately be those that can show that they have projects and are producing oil that is on the lower spectrum uh, of greenhouse gas intensity, and that has sort of a socially and environmentally responsible footprint that will win uh, market share, I think, in Europe over time. Now, in a crisis, they're trying to get every barrel they can get, but over time, as they think about the long-term energy transition in Europe and what role there is for oil, at least their objective is try to get not just the lowest cost, but also barrels that reflect 
adjust transition approach and lower greenhouse gas intensity. Next slide, please. So what about natural gas? Obviously a bit more directly relevant for this audience uh, in British Columbia. Uh, we, we've been talking quite a bit here at Columbia and at Eurasia Group uh, and with others in the Canadian government about, and the US government about the Russian gas situation, right? It's, it's not as easy to move Russian gas, natural gas, to places like China and India as it is oil, right? Because oil is mostly going by tanker and with natural gas, it's mostly going by pipeline. There's a little bit of LNG. But I think we're looking at a, a, a possible scenario here where there's a big opportunity for Canadian natural gas, right? With more U.S. liquefied natural gas going to Western Europe, there may be a greater need for Canadian liquefied natural gas from our West Coast going to Asia to, to not only meet the growing demand in Asia, but to replace some of the U.S. gas that's probably going to end up in Europe. So I think the, the key question here really is, what would actually enable that opportunity? What are the conditions that we need from regulatory policy, social, financial perspective to make that happen? Next slide. Well, to answer my own question, I think um, there's a few things, right? That, but, the, but what it really comes down to is uh, the Europeans will be buying more natural gas than they had planned to, to replace this missing Russian gas. But it's not going to be business as usual, right? They're really looking for countries like Canada that have very low flaring, very low fugitive emissions in their gas production, countries that can integrate renewable electricity into the production of liquefied natural gas, uh, countries that can, uh, you know, develop carbon neutral, uh, net zero uh, upstream operations, and then countries that have LNG projects that are uh, so-called hydrogen ready, that can become uh, a pathway uh, from gas to hydrogen over time, especially over 10 to 15 year horizon. And I think some other speakers will be talking about that here on our panel as well. But the main point is, it's not just the business as usual LNG model. There are some new specific environment and climate focused criteria that uh, the Europeans in particular will be looking for. Next slide. So why is gas important? I mean, I think it's not a question of gas versus wind and solar. They're not really competing with each other in Europe. They actually have to kind of work together. And what this chart shows is that in the advanced world, in the top half of the chart, um, you know, natural gas, the light purple color here, plays a really big role in providing backup power capacity for variable resources like wind and solar. But when you look at the bottom half of the chart in the developing world, uh, you see a lot of coal uh, playing the role of uh, backup fuel for wind and solar when it's not sunny or, or, or windy enough. Now, over time, the expectation is uh, the wind and solar will be partnered with not coal and gas, but with hydrogen and batteries. The, the problem is that's not available at scale today. So over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, it's really gonna be a choice between coal and natural gas as the partner to the variable wind and solar resource that are out there in Europe and elsewhere. The problem is right now that if we don't grow natural gas supply and natural gas prices stay high, a lot of these countries are gonna use coal uh, as, as a partner for wind and solar, not, not natural gas. Uh, and again, I don't think the batteries and hydrogen are ready to scale quite yet. Next slide, please. So I think what we get here is that there's a risk of a scenario where when you have very expensive natural gas like we have now, where we've got very high prices in Western Canada and the US, but really double or triple or even four times higher natural gas prices then we're paying North America that we're seeing in places like Western Europe, China, India, et cetera. So what's happening is that after all the talk in COP27, or pardon me, COP26 in Glasgow about a global coal phase out, the war, the Russia-Ukraine war and the subsequent gas price spike have really forced some key countries to delay their plans to eliminate their coal production uh, because the gas is just too expensive. And we are seeing coal imports from uh, you know, European coal imports from countries like Canada, Colombia, and the U.S., South Africa start to grow again after sort of years of decline. So it's this balance between energy affordability, which is coal, and environmental and security concerns around, around natural gas and that push and pull. And I do think that British Columbia and Canada can be part of the solution by providing lower cost, uh, more sustainable sources of natural gas, ideally with First Nations partnership, as we're discussing here today, to help not only displace the Russian gas, 
but prevent this sort of return to increased coal use around the world as well. Next slide. Now, there's another reason to think about natural gas as well in this conversation, which is, um, you know, wind and solar and batteries are going to play a very, very important role and, and clean electricity will play a very important role uh, in producing green hydrogen, in decarbonizing the transportation sector with electric vehicles, in decarbonizing the heating sector with electric heat pumps, and in potentially powering big industrial operations like LNG production. The, the problem is that do we have enough clean dispatchable electricity to do all of those things? Or do we need to make choices about where do we use our wind and solar and hydroelectricity and where do we use natural gas or nuclear or another resource? What this chart shows is that to get to the Paris Agreement carbon neutral net zero world by 2050, we're going to need a lot of green hydrogen. And the green hydrogen, as you may know, is made with clean electricity and electrolysis. Uh, but you're going to need a lot of new clean electricity production to get to the amount of green hydrogen we need to hit the IA net zero scenario. So much, in fact, we're going to need the equivalent of current US and Chinese electricity production by 2050 just to make the green hydrogen that we need. So I don't know if we're going to have enough electricity, enough transmission distribution to really get to that level of green hydrogen production, which may keep that sort of gas to hydrogen, blue hydrogen pathway in the discussion uh, for a little bit longer uh, as well. Next slide. So moving beyond natural gas, uh, what about mining? And, and I think what's interesting when we look at the mining sector and we compare it to oil and natural gas is that when you talk to investors about oil and natural gas, even in the context of the current very high prices, there are still questions about the longer term demand for oil and natural gas when you go 10, 15, 20 years out. And those impact investment decisions today because a lot of oil and gas projects are going to have a 20, 30, 40 year lifespan. That's not true with mining. <laughs> when it comes to mining for critical minerals like copper or graphite uh, or bauxite or rare earths or lithium, the demand picture is, is seen as much stronger and, and much, much more um, uh, of a strong signal for long term investment and maybe a less riskier type of investment than, than oil uh, in particular. Because again, if we're displacing oil with electric vehicles and electric vehicles need critical minerals, that suggests the growth story. So what this chart shows here really is that as we increase the role of solar and wind in electricity generation, we get a corresponding increase in critical minerals demand, right? So oil supply may be going down, but critical de minerals demand is going up as we move to more wind, solar, batteries, et cetera. And of course, British Columbia, uh, our First Nations and Canada broadly have many critical mineral resources to develop and contribute. So yes, natural gas probably is part of this energy security discussion and climate discussion, but so too will be these critical minerals that can really be a key part of the energy transition um, going forward. Next slide, please. Now, right now, when you look at where are the clean energy uh, materials being built, we can see that on the, solar, on the top half of this chart, the solar supply chain, whether it's the raw materials, the process materials, the components, or the final assembly of modules, China is the dominant player in solar. And the Biden administration announced yesterday they've used the Defense Production Act to try to encourage more domestic solar manufacturing in the US. But we look at hydrogen, and whether it's green hydrogen or blue hydrogen, it's a very different picture. China's role in the hydrogen supply chain is actually quite small. And there's a much more diversified set of countries that play a big role in the hydrogen supply chain. Again, whether it's electrolyzers or whether it's uh, you know the, the technologies and materials that go into blue hydrogen production, uh, we see a much more diversified supply chain, including Canada and British Columbia. So there's a big advantage, I think, for hydrogen, where solar and batteries already have China leading position, the hydrogen supply chain is still being built. And that maybe is where there's a big opportunity for British Columbia in particular. Next slide. So probably the question that people ask me more than anything else these days is, okay, the last five, six, seven years since the Paris Agreement was signed, there's been a lot of focus on ESG, on net zero, on decarbonization. 
does this Russia-Ukraine war and having $30 natural gas in Europe and $120 oil, does that change the trajectory for decarbonization? And I think for the most part, the answer is no. And if anything, I think we're actually having a more honest debate about what it's going to take to decarbonize the economy uh, globally. And I would just offer two observations. The, the first is that I think policymakers are realizing that if you shrink supply of oil and natural gas and coal without addressing demand, you kind of get the conditions that we have today, which are very high prices. So we're really going to need to accelerate efforts to reduce demand for oil and natural gas and coal uh, if we really want to uh, move the needle on the emission side. Otherwise, we're just going to see the kind of high prices that we see today with demand, uh, you know, a very sort of regressive effect of demand on lower income households. The other thing we're seeing is that, as indicated by this quote from the European Central Bank, there's a recognition that given the fact that we have to build these supply chains for clean energy, whether it's hydrogen or wind or solar or batteries, and that there's limited supplies of critical minerals, limited supplies of critical mineral processing, very long supply chains that are complicated and sometimes run through everywhere from China to Bolivia, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, there's a very strong inflationary impact of the energy transition as well. That getting from where we are today to net zero is going to require some cost. And that's something that central banks and policymakers are going to have to deal with, which is how do we balance the need to go to net zero while maintaining you know, affordability uh, for consumers uh, as well. And one thing the Europeans have done, even prior to the Russia-Ukraine war, is to bring gas and nuclear sort of back into their ESG taxonomy and say that, well, we may not want gas and nuclear forever, but for the next couple of decades as a transition to truly zero carbon fuels, it's going to be an important resource. Next slide, please. So the last thing I'll say here as, as my time runs out is that just food for thought, circling back to Russia, as the European super majors like Shell and BP, the big integrated oil companies, they, they've invested billions of dollars in Russia that's mostly gone to waste. As they leave Russia, where will they go? And how can we attract them back to Canada and British Columbia? And I think the good news is that we have projects like clean hydrogen and renewable natural gas and offshore wind and critical minerals that we know those companies are looking for. So it'd be great to get them to come back to Canada. Maybe not to the oil sands, maybe those days are gone for them, at least for the Europeans. But it's not to say there are other great opportunities uh, for Canada as well, including natural gas, hydrogen, et cetera. So with that, my time is up, and I appreciate the chance to talk to all of you today and look forward to the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, RJ. Very interesting and lots of food for thought. Um, next up is Rob Hansen. Rob is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Monolith, where he leads the development of next generation technology for producing cost competitive clean hydrogen and carbon black, an important raw material used by the automotive sector. Rob. Great. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm really excited to get to talk to this group. Uh, one little bit more on my background. Um, while I uh, am now an American, I, uh, I'm also a Canadian, and I, I grew up in the city of Saskatoon um, in the province of Saskatchewan. And so I've spent many good days in the great province of British Columbia. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the monolith story today. This is a hydrogen story, um, and it, it kind of is a nice segue from Robert's excellent talk. Uh, and so why don't I just start with how we see the long-term energy transition going. Uh, we think there's at least three pillars. Uh, there's clean electricity, which is everything from wind and solar to traditional nuclear, SMRs, hydro, obviously, geothermal. Uh, and then you're going to need to be able to store that uh, energy for short durations, as well as get it mobile for doing light and medium duty transportation. And we think that batteries... Uh, likely centered around lithium ion batteries are going to be the heavy lift on that. Uh, but that only gets you about half of the way towards what we need to do for a broadly decarbonized economy. And uh, there's obviously no silver bullets in the energy transition, but there's this concept of the silver shotgun where you have lots of different uh, technologies. And I think a lot of those different technologies will play out in the production of clean hydrogen. 
Uh, and hydrogen has this opportunity to decarbonize a lot of the otherwise hard to decarbonize sectors. So things like heavy transportation, including marine and air, uh, a lot of the chemicals, I'll talk about ammonia today and how that fits into agriculture, but obviously steel is another great opportunity. If hydrogen's anything, uh, it's a reducing agent uh, by definition. And so you can imagine reducing iron ore, which we're going to need to do for some time uh, through hydrogen as being quite attractive. Uh, and then long duration energy storage. If, if you think of how we do the long duration energy storage today, it's largely uh, through, at least in the US and Canada, storing natural gas in underground geological caverns. Um, it's not really feasible to consider doing that with batteries, but it is with a gas like hydrogen. All right, so Monolith, we are a clean hydrogen company that has a process that is neither blue nor green, uh, but sits uh, in a different part of the color spectrum, um, and it's called methane pyrolysis. And so what this is, is this is you use clean electricity and use natural gas, but you don't burn the natural gas. Instead, you use the electricity to heat the gas to very high temperatures. And uh, methane, the main component of natural gas, has this really great thermodynamic property, which is if you heat it up to very high temperatures in the absence of oxygen, it will split uh, entirely into clean hydrogen and solid carbon. Uh, what's pictured in the center there is uh, the only commercial scale methane pyrolysis plant on the planet. Uh, it's uh, ours that came online a couple of years ago called Olive Creek One. Uh, and it's doing precisely uh, what I just mentioned, which is splitting natural gas into solid carbon and hydrogen. Uh, this obviously does two big things for you. Number one, you've just created hydrogen without emitting CO2 to the atmosphere. And then number two, and this is where a lot of our specific technology fits in is if you can add that first word I have on the chart, valuable to the solid carbon, not only do you pull the carbon out uh, and not allow it to go into the atmosphere, but you can create economic value. You can also create environmental value if you are replacing otherwise uh, kind of pollutive processes in making solid carbons. Uh, we're starting with a product called Carbon Black. It's about a 20 million metric ton per year market. It uh, is ubiquitous. Uh, it's with everyone every day of their lives, even if they don't know it. Uh, its main use is one third of every tire, car, bus, truck, uh, egg uh, uh, on the planet is carbon black. So a tire is about two thirds rubber, one third carbon black. Uh, and it's this really fine uh, engineered grade of solid carbon that can go in and like carbon fiber reinforce these elastomers. All right. So more on the carbon footprint. So here are the different ways you can make hydrogen. Uh, the first way, which is called steam methane reforming, uh, you take steam and you take methane and you combine them with additional heat from burning gas and you make hydrogen, but you also make CO2, 11.3 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen. This is essentially how all the hydrogen that we produce today is made, which is a lot. We make 100 million tons of hydrogen on the planet, primarily for refining and for making ammonia. And in the process of doing that, we emit over a gigaton of CO2. You can put carbon capture. That's what some people refer to as blue hydrogen. Um, there's a lot of variables that go into it, but uh, you can get down to roughly three kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen. That's obviously limited by uh, where you have sequestration resources. So you know, US Gulf Coast, you'll likely see some good projects get built out. Uh, places like British Columbia, probably pretty tough. California, tough. When you have you know, potential seismic activity, that's always the tough thing with large amounts of CO2 going into the subsurface. Uh, and then you have monolith, which is pyrolysis. And so the first number, the 0 0.45, which is a 96% reduction compared to the traditional process, is if we use 100% fossil natural gas. Uh, so although we have no direct emissions or what's called scope one emissions at site, uh, we do have emissions upstream primarily from methane leakage and methane obviously is a powerful greenhouse gas. Um, this model assumes California's low carbon fuel standard assumption, which is 1.4% methane leakage on its way to our end use. And so when you do that, you have some emissions 0 0.45, but still a massive reduction compared to the status quo. Uh, electrolysis, which is splitting water, some people call it green hydrogen, has the promise of getting to zero if you use 100% clean electricity. Um, I will note, though, that it takes a lot of electricity, and I, I think Robert's point was exactly right. Uh, our future is not going to be infinite free clean electricity. 
Um, I started in the solar industry, was there for many years. Um, like every energy resource, we are going to be limited. And so uh, the tricky part with electrolysis is it takes at least 40 kilowatt hours per kilogram of electricity because you're lifting water all the way from the zero state to this free hydrogen state. Uh, pyrolysis, where you have methane, which if you think back to deep time was water at some point and photosynthesis lifted it up to a carbohydrate and then was reduced into uh, hydrocarbon, takes a lot less energy to split, seven times, in fact, less energy to split than water does per unit of hydrogen. Uh, but then the last one, this is a really interesting one, is if you pyrolyze renewable natural gas, which is biogas, you actually go negative. And this is negative in the best way. If you track the carbon through, you had CO2 in the atmosphere, a green plant took that to, uh, say, glucose, C6H1206. You anaerobically digest that into methane. Typically, you burn RNG. The CO2 goes back into the atmosphere, and you've got a cycle. Instead of burning the RNG at the end, you pyrolyze it. The carbon ends up being sequestered, and it uh, is a net negative in the best possible way that it used to be in the atmosphere and is now sequestered. So that's a fun one as a, a bit of a side case for us. All right, so that's the company. Let me tell you a little about the journey. Uh, we started way back in 2013, uh, but methane pyrolysis has been around a lot longer than that. The first patent's from 1918, so people have been working on this for 100 years. We started by partnering with a French university in Sophie Antipolis, south of France, uh, and they had a little pilot reactor. Professor Laurent Fulchery had been working on this since the 1990s. And so we partnered with him, uh, and here is a picture of his pilot plant, one kilogram per hour. And then next, we scaled it up in Redwood City, California. So right on the San Francisco Bay, uh, we were 500 yards away from a 5,000 employee Google campus. So it was a very sensitive site from both people as well as uh, environmentally with the San Francisco Bay. But it's 10x scale up, uh, the reactors there in the middle. And we ran that from 2014 to 2018 to really prove the technology could work at that demonstration scale. And then like all entrepreneurs and engineers, when that worked, we said, let's make it bigger. And so we scaled up to uh, our commercial unit, one commercial unit, 600 kilograms per hour of hydrogen production that came online in 2020. It's fully operational right now. The part in the center is the reactor, the kind of tall structure that is uh, the biggest methane pyrolysis plant uh, ever built and it's full scale. And so then the next step for us is to, you see on the top left, that's all of Creek One, that's real. The rest is the engineering design. We're going to be building 12 more of those modular units to scale the production up to 7.5 tons per hour. Uh, this project we announced uh, in December, a $1 billion loan from the U.S. Department of Energy, their first new loan under the Title 17 program under the Biden administration. And uh, we will be putting a shovel in the ground for the expansion later this year with an online date of 2025. Uh, the front part, the kind of bottom part where you see in the bottom left, the big cylindrical tank, this is what we're doing with our hydrogen at this plant. We're using our hydrogen and on site, we're converting it into anhydrous ammonia. Ammonia is the main end use of hydrogen today. It's the kind of mother of all nitrogen fertilizers. And we are walking into a very dangerous situation globally. Uh, Russia is the largest exporter of ammonia. It goes through the Tagliati pipeline, which weaves through Ukraine offloads into the Black Sea at Odessa. That pipe has been shut. Uh, and the world's going to be, is already very short of ammonia. So we're moving into some pretty uh, rough times from a food security perspective. And, uh, you know, we think ammonia is one of the kind of best and most impactful things to do with clean hydrogen. And then our future plans are replicating that plant. We have 40 projects in development. Seven of them we call key projects. One of them you'll notice in a familiar geography to this conference. Um, and so we're really excited to expand our uh, technology and development and help be a, a part uh, of the energy transition through clean hydrogen production. So. Thank you all so much uh, and look forward to the conversation at the end. Thank you very much, Rob. Very interesting and congratulations on uh, development progress. Next up is uh, Gary Schuback. Gary is Vice President of Business Development and Government Relations for Econa Power. Gary is a professional mechanical engineer with 30 years of experience developing and commercializing new clean energy technologies. Gary. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Gary Schuback, the Vice President of Business Development at Econa Power. And I'm speaking to you here from our offices in Greater Vancouver, 
which are the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'll advance my slides. There they are. So Econa Power is a Vancouver-based startup company. We're developing uh, low-cost clean hydrogen using a technology called methane pyrolysis. And, and Rob, uh, before me, did a great job presenting that, so he saved me lots of time. Our technology is um, earlier stage. We're presently in the development stages of de developing something that we think is unique and exciting. Uh, our goal is to produce clean, low-cost, scalable hydrogen for industry. Our company was formed over four years ago by an initial investment from Suncor and Synovus, who are looking to this platform to help decarbonize their upstream operations. Since then, and more recently, earlier this year, we closed a Series A financing round that brought in companies like Baker Hughes, ConocoPhillips, Mitsui, and others uh, into the investment mix for our company. We're just so thrilled to have them join us. And in each case, these companies are looking at methane pyrolysis as a strategic technology that can decarbonize natural gas and help sustain their operations, but more importantly, drive acceleration of decarbonization by leveraging existing natural gas assets and infrastructure. I also just want to mention the partnerships we have with government. We've had great partnerships with government, both federally and provincially, and we're just so grateful for them. And for us, partnership is a, a very big deal, and we're just really pleased to be here. And hopefully this will be the first step in developing some very um, long-standing partnerships with the First Nations in British Columbia. Um, hydrogen markets. So traditionally, hydrogen is used as an industry feedstock. Um, Nat uh, ammonia and uh, oil uh, processing. But going forward, it will become um, a decarbonizing agent for many di difficult to decarbonize sectors of the economy, areas that we can't electrify. So it's very important that we find ways to produce hydrogen at scale uh, while making it clean and low cost. And current efforts to do that, blue hydrogen, where we use carbon capture sequestration, adds cost to the technology. Uh, electrolysis from renewable electricity can be very expensive unless very low cost electricity can be um, harnessed. And so our company is looking to develop clean hydrogen that doesn't add cost. It, the, the solution we're developing is a unique methane pyrolysis uh, solution that uses the energy of combustion to drive the process. Our reactor takes feedstock methane and then separately we have a combustion event and inject that energy of the combustion into the reactor where rapid mixing causes the gases to heat to reach their pyrolysis conditions and generate hydrogen and solid carbon. To build a practical machine, we add multiple reactors together that operate in sequence to produce continuous hydrogen and carbon production. You can think of it a little bit like an engine, how your engine has multiple cylinders that operate in sequence and our technology will operate in that same manner. And then to scale the technology, we build a system around it that separates the solid carbon out, separates the water out, and then another technique to separate the hydrogen out called a PSA. And all of these separation technologies are industry standard pieces of equipment that the oil and gas sector use today. And so at the end of this, we have a process that uses a unique reactor to split methane into carbon and hydrogen, an industry standard balance of plant that wraps around it to provide the outputs of hydrogen and carbon to industry. The value of the technology is low cost and clean. Our target was to produce a solution that can produce 90% decarbonized hydrogen while meeting the same cost metrics of existing steam methane reforming. And our projections show that this is quite possible. At a large scale industrial plant size, we can see producing hydrogen for less than $2 a kilogram, which is lower than existing SMR and CCS technology. More than that, however, it's a technology that can be flexibly deployed. We aren't reliant on water feedstock. We don't rely on CO2 sequestration infrastructure, and we do not rely on renewable electricity to produce hydrogen and carbon. And for those reasons, the technology can be deployed anywhere that you have natural gas assets and infrastructure. And we think this is a real uh, a strong asset for the technology. 
Now let's talk about natural gas decarbonization. So this is a very important part of our company's commercialization trajectory. As I mentioned, there's uh, growth in hydrogen and all sorts of new applications and natural gas decarbonization is, is one of the keys. I see in the future natural gas being uh, delivered to markets through pipelines and on the way to market being decarbonized using uh, methane pyrolysis. And the figure on the left just shows a, a schematic of, of that vision where methane pyrolysis is removing solid carbon from the pipeline network. And we're delivering natural gas and hydrogen together as a mix to downstream energy markets. Now that can be taken all the way to an extreme where we have 100% hydrogen delivery, but we can also begin today to start to decarbonize that infrastructure and deliver energy, chemical energy to markets that is uh, decarbonized along the way. Now, the thing that I uh, want to point out here is the importance of decarbonization and cost. And uh, the figure on the right shows the hydrogen production cost and the GHG intensity of different techniques for achieving this um, decarbonization of natural gas. Electrolysis is a perfectly great way to make clean hydrogen. And in British Columbia, we are very, very blessed with clean electricity from our hydroelectricity assets. So we can produce clean hydrogen here in British Columbia. Uh, but at current electricity prices, it tends to be very expensive, upwards of $5 a kilogram to produce that hydrogen. Uh, steam methane reforming is GHG intensive and implementing CCS does add cost, but it, it is still a relatively low cost hydrogen molecule at $2 a kilogram. And its greenhouse gas emissions are upwards of three uh, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. When we look at our methane pyrolysis solution, the emissions and cost balance is among or perhaps the best of all the technology uh, applications available to us and being that british columbia is wealthy in low-cost natural gas and has a broad infrastructure for delivering that chemical energy to market we see a real opportunity in british columbia to begin decarbonizing that infrastructure and to begin decarbonizing the delivery of that chemical energy to market where are we well we're an early stage company uh, we've completed the proof of concept reactor development shown on the top left. Uh, today, we're now scaling that reactor to a 200 kilogram per day capacity for de uh, deployment in our pilot plant later. Uh, in 2023, we will start uh, integrating that system into a fully integrated platform for platform testing. And then in 2024, we will deploy a one ton per day pilot in Alberta for testing and further development with our strategic partners and customers. And the figures on the right, you can see just some of the activity going on in our facility now. We're, you know, we're building that 200 kilogram per day reactor and we're assembling the system around it, which will test it using conventional carbon separation and natural gas heating te techniques. Our go-to-market plan, well, as I mentioned, we, we just completed a Series A investment, uh, which raised over $70 million. And that will take our company through uh, pilot operations. Uh, our goal is to complete the three-year development program ahead of us, reactor scaling, system integration, and pilot deployment. And then conduct pilot operations with our partners to demonstrate the technology, uh, to demonstrate the carbon handling and delivery to downstream subsequent markets, and to in interface with them on how we can work together to scale that technology into their own operations. Our goal will be to, to deploy a handful of such early commercial plants with our strategic partners uh, in the latter half of the decade. And each of those will then inform our licensing approach to more broadly deploy the technology into uh, decarbonization vectors like steel production, natural gas decarbonization, power generation, and um, home heat and power. So we have a, a trajectory that seeks to commercialize the technology in the second half of the decade and then scale its deployment through licensing transactions next decade. And this is our presentation. I've left 30 minutes on the table for additional questions and I look forward to that discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. I uh, appreciate that and uh, interesting technology contrast with Rob's presentation. 
Uh, next up is uh, Dana Wong. She's the Senior Manager, Renewable and Low Carbon Fuel Strategy at Fortis. She's been working at the intersection of North American energy and climate markets for over 15 years to advance energy efficiency, renewable energy, and low carbon energy solutions. Dana, over to you. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dana Wong and I work to advance renewable and low carbon fuels for Fortis BC. And I am grateful to call in today from the traditional unceded territory, the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people, whose oral histories have connected them to this, to this land since time immemorial. Fortis BC respects indigenous peoples in this place we call Canada, on whose traditional territories we all live, work and play. In my short time with you today, I'll tell you a little bit about Fortis BC, both as a company and how we're rethinking energy to work toward a net zero energy future. And also how we're partnering for progress, specifically with Indigenous groups and communities to meet climate action goals. Fortis BC is a Canadian owned and BC based company with more than 2,500 employees across the province. We're BC's largest energy provider, delivering renewable energy, natural gas and electricity to 1.2 million customers in 135 communities, 57 Indigenous communities across 150 traditional territories. We own nearly 50,000 kilometers of natural gas lines, 7,200 kilometers of electric transmission and distribution lines, through which we are increasingly delivering renewable energy solutions to homes, businesses, industry, and transportation markets. Our policies and actions support the province's Clean BC Roadmap to 2030, the Paris Climate Agreement, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We're committed to Indigenous relationships and reconciliation, and we actively invest in Indigenous communities, job training, and recruitment. Now, before I explain how BC, Fortis BC is driving BC's energy transition, it's important to remember that BC's electric and gas energy systems have to work together first and foremost to ensure system reliability and resiliency, but also to lower the overall costs of decarbonizing BC's energy economy, which directly impacts energy affordability. This has uh, clearly been a common theme today throughout earlier sessions. Okay, so Fortis BC's vision is to transform BC's energy future. Our long-term energy and climate strategy is summarized here in our Clean Growth Pathway to 2050, which both supports and aligns with the province's Clean BC plan and ambitious climate targets. At the same time, our 30 by 30 target reflects a commitment to ensure that we're making progress along the way by helping our customers cut their emissions 30% by the year 2030. So our clean growth pathway highlights four key pillars, which you see here, to support a diversified, flexible energy approach. Firstly, we've been investing in energy efficiency and conservation opportunities in homes, businesses, and industry. This helps our customers reduce energy consumption, save money, lessen their greenhouse gas footprint. Um, we've been investing roughly $100 million annually in efficiency rebates. Last year, we hit nearly $120 million, which makes us one of Canada's largest private investors in energy efficiency. The second pillar is developing renewable gases to decarbonize our gas supply. Renewable natural gas, RNG, and hydrogen are playing a vital role in BC's energy transformation. What is RNG, you might ask? RNG is a carbon neutral energy source that's derived from decomposing organic matter at landfills, in, in agricultural waste, in wastewater treatment plants, and so on. It blends seamlessly into the existing pipeline system and it's carbon neutral because it doesn't contribute any net climate emissions to the atmosphere. So instead of pulling um, conventional natural gas out of the ground, we're able to capture existing methane that would otherwise escape to the environment and use it instead of conventional gas to heat our homes and provide heat for industry. So the result is that we're using, RN using RNG releases only biogenic or naturally existing carbon dioxide so that no new emissions are added to the natural carbon cycle. Now, we've been offering RNG to our customers as a drop-in fuel replacement for over a decade, and we've been aggressively expanding our renewable gas supply. Due to surging demand over the past few years, um, we tripled supply volumes last year, and we expect to do, again, the same this year. Um, in the next three years, so by 2025, we expect to have contracts in place for about 24 petajoules of renewable gas, or over 10% of our total natural gas supply. 
To put that amount of energy into perspective, securing 15% of our gas supply with renewable gas is about the electric equivalent of bringing over one and a half site C dams into service. The third pillar you see here is supporting zero and low carbon transportation fleets and infrastructure. Transportation makes up the biggest share of BC's provincial emissions and is the most challenging sector to decarbonize. So on that note, in the light duty sector, Fortis BC has been building and operating 40 fast charging EV stations across various communities in BC's southern interior. And in the medium and heavy duty sector, we've been helping to deploy about a thousand zero and low carbon vehicles to BC's roads, which reduces not only greenhouse gas emissions, but local air pollutants as well along major transportation corridors. The final pillar you see here is deploying liquefied natural gas or LNG to replace the most carbon intensive fuels in industry in the local marine sector. Our Tilbury LNG facility in Delta provides among the cleanest LNG in the world because it uses clean electricity to produce the energy. And when that LNG is used to displace diesel and marine bunker oil, we all benefit, not just from reduced climate emissions, but lower particulate matter, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide emissions, et cetera which contributes to better air quality in our ports, along our coastlines, and globally as well. One of our marine transportation partners, CSPAN, recently became the first Canadian marine company to pilot using RNG in its liquefied natural gas fuel vessels. So the key takeaway I want to leave you here with is that Fortis BC can be an important partner in the journey to net zero and beyond, because we can leverage our infrastructure to move clean electrons and gas molecules from one corner of the province to another. Energy systems have traditionally been, um, they've reflected a more linear model of moving energy from a centralized production center to areas of demand or consumption. But today's energy is increasingly coming from different feedstocks from all over BC and beyond. Our distribution network is gonna play a critical role in um, local and regional decarbonization as we deploy low carbon and renewable solutions across the energy economy. And what that means for you, of course, is that there's significant opportunity to develop partnerships to drive the energy transition, particularly with Indigenous groups, communities, local governments, any others who own or manage renewable energy feedstocks, such as agricultural and food waste, uh, wood waste and biomass, etc., to develop the sustainable energy resources that we need across BC. Now, a critical part of how we do business is engaging with Indigenous communities and striving to achieve mutually beneficial outcomes in ways that are harmonious with Indigenous values. Whether it's partnering to develop renewable energy supply, investing in energy efficiency, or other zero and low carbon energy resources, Fortis BC is working hard to ensure that Indigenous forces are recognized, heard, and valued throughout the energy transition. So a few points on this slide highlight some examples of how we've been working with and partnering with Indigenous groups and governments to advance BC's climate goals, from installing EV charging stations to exploring renewable energy opportunities, to collaborating with First Nations on proposed projects to protect and preserve important ecologically or culturally sensitive areas. Through our Climate Action Partners Program, we also have resources and funding to ensure that our Indigenous partners can play an active role in both shaping and owning a piece of the energy transition. We know that we can't do this alone, so to, to achieve an energy future that goes beyond zero, we have to focus on leading these active partnerships with governments, industry, academia, and above all, with Indigenous partners to achieve our shared climate goals. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Dana, and welcome back, everyone. And uh, we have some time now for some Q&A, and uh, I'll watch the questions uh, that are coming in, but uh, I'm going to just offer up one where we can go around uh, the table here and maybe kick us off. The um, When I listen to these presentations and when I, you know, Google around the internet about hydrogen, um, it seems almost too good to be true, right? I can power everything from my rocket ship to my car and everything in between. I can decarbonize the existing gas system. We just heard about that. I can use it to make electricity that's emissions free or negative emissions. I can make steel, I can make fertilizer, basically does it all, the, the miracle fuel, um, and it's all emissions free. So why hasn't it happened yet? So I'm interested in each of your views. And, and, and just to put it in context for this conference, like specifically, 
not only why it hasn't it happened yet, but what will it take to make it happen and and make BC and Canada real? I, I you know we're competing with everybody. Everyone has a hydrogen strategy. So why hasn't it happened yet? And what can we do to make us first and best and better? So maybe I'll I'll go through in the you know opposite order that we did the presentations. Dana, I'll let you go first. Sure. Um, maybe to the quick answer to your question, Dane, is why it hasn't happened yet is with any uh, newer technology, uh, it's expensive. Um, and, but there are a number of ways that Fortis BC is looking to bring it onto our system, whether it's, um, uh, you know, building out hydrogen hubs to both uh, produce hydrogen and then also consume the hydrogen on site, uh, also hydrogen blending into the system. But, and again, to answer that question of why it hasn't happened yet, is that we do still have to examine the, the physical properties of hydrogen, how it might uh, react with the existing natural gas and renewable gas in the system before we can safely inject it into the system. So we are working with our technical regulators, uh, academia, and other partners to build out all the various pieces that will enable this hydrogen vision to come together. Okay, thanks. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts? I have two thoughts. The first is um, hydrogen, you have to manufacture hydrogen. So it sounds too good to be true, but we just can't go and collect it. It doesn't reside in any pockets that we can tap into like we do natural gas. We have to produce hydrogen. It's a chemical fuel that is produced um, from energy sources uh, like you know gas or electricity and um, it needs to be produced in a manner that's clean. And um, so that's one thing. It's not, a, it's not a resource we can tap into. We need to manufacture it. Uh, the other thing is a, a point of infrastructure. Uh, the transition to this hydrogen economy that we've talked about now for decades, and I've been part of that discussion for decades, it really is a transition of uh, infrastructure. Uh, for vehicles, that means uh, fueling station infrastructure. Um, for export markets, that means um, shipping and receiving terminals and 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 um, and the ships that move the the fuel. Uh, for pipes, it means pipeline transitions from gas to hydrogen pipelines, and that infrastructure uh, is slow to move and slow to change. And big investments are required to make those transitions. And so one of the themes that I just made comment on in my talk was about leveraging existing infrastructure. How can we use existing infrastructure for moving natural gas as a way to accelerate our transition into this hydrogen economy? Uh, moving natural gas that's blended with hydrogen is one way to make that first transition. Using LNG export and import as a means to move hydrogen molecules is a way to begin that um, that export market for Canada and other nations where we can move hydrogen in existing infrastructures and deploy hydrogen production at the receiving terminal instead of transitioning our entire global uh, infrastructure for import export. So there's, there's a, a real big story about infrastructure, risk and investment that kind of comes in play when we're talking about this transition to hydrogen and it's not just about the molecule. Yeah, those are really important points, thanks. Um, what do you think, Rob? Um, let me answer it in a little bit of a different way. So I think if we could, you know, mobilize the country or the continent's engineering and scientific talent like we did in the Manhattan Project, you know, a modern day Manhattan Project and the mission was find the best possible transportation fuel. I think after 10 years of the smartest people working with infinite resources, they'd come back and they'd say, Eureka, we've discovered it. It's gasoline. Um, and I say it half joking, but it's, I think the reality of our existing energy uh, ecosystem is not by chance. It's that, you know, massive deep time energy transfers of liquid hydrocarbons that are liquid at room temperature and 700 kilograms per meter cubed. Like there's a reason that our species has, has, you know, completely developed off of 
those energy resources. So I wanted to level set that I think it's a bit of a mistake to think that, you know, hydrogen is some necessarily better fuel with the sole exception of this. Um, the problem with the fossil fuels is obviously you transfer all that deep time energy in this, you know, really transportable form. But when you burn it, you transfer the CO2 from the ancient atmosphere to today's. And that's the problem. And so it's only when you put that additional constraint of we want a great fuel that can do all types of different things, but it can't have a carbon emission, does hydrogen become, you know, interesting. And so almost by definition, it's going to be tougher on a full cycle economic scale than just burning fossil fuels until you realize uh, the cost impact of releasing that ancient CO2 into today's atmosphere. And I'm going to come back to, I'm going to touch on some of that in my next question, because you can get, people can start thinking about it now, is the importance of government policies in relation to solving some of these problems. So, but uh, Robert, RJ, I'll let you go next. Yeah, I think that's the right uh, question, right? Because I was thinking, as other speakers were answering, that the consistency of a long-term policy signal that would capture the externality of greenhouse gas emissions in the way that Rob just mentioned is important, right? That we kind of had it in the 1990s for a little while, then we kind of had it in the late 2000s, and now it's coming back again. But you need a, a longer, more consistent signal and commitment to carbon pricing that would help things like hydrogen. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, hydrogen is not going to be a silver bullet. And I think that it's an important part of the energy mix going forward, but we need to have diversification, right? So we're going to need clean electricity, clean hydrogen, clean advanced bioenergy, energy efficiency, probably some kind of nuclear and some kind of decarbonized oil and gas. In the same way that historically we had oil, gas, and coal, we're going to need a portfolio of solutions going forward as well. Not that there's flaws in any one of those particular technologies or fuels, but more that they're going to make more sense in certain regions than in others. And, um, you know, we, we want to have kind of multiple pathways so that if there are problems in one supply chain, we can have uh, diversification. I think we all see the value of that these days. So, RJ, since, you know, you are Eurasia Group, I'm going to ask you again the second part of the question. What's Canada's or BC's advantage? Like, how do we win this game? Yeah, I think I was going to say that I think BC has had a consistent climate policy. And I may not always feel that way, but compared to a lot of other places around the world, trust me, it's very, <laughs> very consistent. Um, and I think that that does kind of attract the kind of innovation that my fellow panelists talked about here today. So, that, so that's one aspect of it. You also have an electorate that is generally committed to climate action in, in various ways. And then, of course, there's a large endowment of natural resources from hydroelectricity to forestry to natural gas to critical minerals. So that's a pretty good combination of things. And I think if you can bring in the fourth piece, which is, you know, one of the most important in this topic of this conference, which is having you know, credible First Nation partners, then you, I think, you have a very unique uh, set of assets that, that I would challenge, you know, would be fine, hard to find elsewhere in the world. What I think is missing is is that story getting through to sort of Bay Street and Wall Street, Davis, who and I have discussed, right? And I think it's one thing to talk about in the abstract. It's nothing to talk about it with specific companies and projects, which is what those guys are looking for, right? As investors, they're not they're not interested in theory and kind of policy. They want to know about specific deals and opportunities. So I think we heard some good ones today, and I think that kind of takes the macro opportunity and narrative down to very specific and investable opportunities. Thanks, RJ. And I, I am going to touch on that point in my closing to these two panels about the importance of that indigenous angle and, and how honestly I believe it's, it is the magic sauce to answer my own question. <laughs> but the um, uh, maybe I'll just throw it open here to anybody that wants to pile on to the government policy question. Does anyone else have any thoughts about the importance of government policy? And I'm thinking Canada or BC and what, what should they do? What's the one thing they could be doing to make a difference right now well go i think ahead. i'll just speak first i'll, I let, think, I'll um, let you start gary and then we'll do rob go ahead gary oh sorry rob i didn't know nope, go ahead go ahead um i think i think a, a really important piece uh 
the, the federal government of Canada can provide is uh, just real con um, consistency on setting uh, greenhouse gas to the intensity standards um, and um, thresholds that um, fix to some, um, you know, either penalties or or um, or the opposite of penalties, which is uh, <laughs> which is support federal support. For, for clean hydrogen production. I think the, the lack of standardization of greenhouse gas emission uh, levels um, helps, uh, doesn't help us pr produce a level playing field for new technologies to come in. Uh, for example, you know, gray hydrogen, as we call it, which has a, a great deal of greenhouse gas emissions, can be penalized by CO2 emissions and, and levies that are associated with those emissions. On the other hand, there could be uh, uh, reciprocal benefits for achieving uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are below certain thresholds that would drive innovation and new companies and new technologies into the marketplace quicker and uh, setting those 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 thresholds clearly consistently through time as well as across Canada would would help put that playing field those pieces together for new technologies okay. to come in okay. thanks Gary Rob yeah I think First is uh, recognition of the scale of the challenge and the likely time horizon. Um, it's, it's very easy for governments to say we're going to do it by 2050. I've yet to see a credible plan anywhere in the world that actually gets there. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and then I think you can look at where we have been successful around the planet. Um, I think the U.S. has been quite successful, particularly in wind with PTC. Um, as many of you probably have been following north of the border, there's a uh, little over half a trillion dollars of tax credits, which are trying to make their way through reconciliation. Um, that's that's happening right now in the US. I think if, if the US could get a half trillion dollar climate bill across the finish line, that would be a pretty strong signal to big parts of the world. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's a vehicle there, Canada's focused more on a carbon tax. I, you can go carrot stick. Um, I'm, I'm more of a carrot kind of person and what I think is effective. Um, and then the big questions, right, are, are what's China going to do? What's India going to do? What's, uh, you know, broad parts of Africa going to do? Because it's it's global climate change. And so I, I think any policy needs to be thinking about it also on a, a global basis. Yeah. So that's great. And we're getting to the end of our time here. The um... You know, I, I agree that it, it does need to be a combination of carrots and sticks from a policy perspective. And I think they need to work together coherently. And one of the things Canada needs to do is act like a country in this respect, because, you know, having battling jurisdictions with battling policies that sometimes are not well synchronized is not going to get this done. And, and I love the Manhattan analogy project. I mean, it's it's bit of a bad metaphor perhaps but 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 the uh but the you know the the notion that we need an extraordinary effort and and i think climate change you know we we've been distracted um all of us by things like wars and 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 you know energy costs and things like that but i think there's an opportunity in there for sure and, and this panel has given us some great food for thought for that uh, we're at the end of our time here there has been a, a couple of techn more technical questions come in on the um, q a and maybe i'll ask some of the panelists to take a look and just reply directly in there to some of these questions because they're actually some of them are aimed right at your companies so you're best positioned to answer those and um yeah and and i think you know some of the other ones perhaps will resurface maybe after the next panel as well. So uh, with that, I'll bring, I'll, you know, thank the panelists and bring this part of the uh, session to a close and we will pivot to panel number two on new energy systems. <laughs>